Well, good evening, everybody. We'll go ahead and uh, get started. Want to welcome everybody here tonight and uh, welcome those joining us online. Um, glad you're with us tonight. Uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 12. Going to start in verse 43 tonight. Um, going to go through uh, Exodus chapter 13, verse 10. And uh, going to kind of fly a little bit tonight. Um, it's going to feel a little bit like review, but uh, as I told you when we kind of started the whole Passover um, chapters, probably the biggest chapters in the Old Testament. And so I want to make sure and take our time and go through them a little bit. And there's a lot of repetition. You know, uh, the fun thing about the Bible is if it was important, you know when a preacher tells something, y'all, y'all hear me do that on Sundays. Don't laugh. Hey, now. Uh, if it's really important, I'm going to say it, say it three times. I'm going to say it three times. Um, and uh, typically, um, I, I, I even look at my notes and make sure I do that because uh, it's real important that uh, to get our memories going, you really have to hear something three times. Um, and, and some of you are laughing. You need it four or five or six, right? It's not enough. Uh, so I'll, I'll up it to five tonight. In the Bible, when you, when you hear something said over and over and over again, it's not, not, oh, man, I've heard this before. This is boring. It ought to be, oh, God's saying this again and again and again. I really need to pay attention to this. And Passover is one of those things that is talked about so often because it's so important. And so uh, as a pastor, as Bible, uh, you know, student of the Bible, um, my, my temptation is to be like, you know what, we've talked about Passover, let me summarize these chapters again, because that's kind of what they do, and let's move on. But if God's going to say it in so much detail three times, and He really did in this, then we're going to do that too. Uh, what's really fun is when you get later on, like we'll do uh, uh, First and Second Kings, and if you studied the Bible or ever gone through, then you come, what comes after Kings? Chronicles, right? And you know, First and Chronicles is almost an exact replica of First and Second Kings. And so, uh, history-wise, there are some differences. But um, don't don't not read, don't don't not study those. And so, what we'll do when we get there, we'll actually lay those books side by side and do a comparison and kind of draw some conclusions from that. But um, I'm going to do a little bit of that tonight. What I want to focus on tonight as Passover, I want to show you in these verses how Passover and communion, the Lord's Supper. I've kind of hinted at that off and on. I want to show you how uh, the New Testament communion uh, or Lord's Supper is so similar to the Passover. Um, I want to kind of lay those side by side today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll start in uh, chapter 12, verse 43. Let's pray. Father, uh, we do thank you as we approach your word tonight. Uh, Father, for the repetition, uh, for reminding us of things we need to know and saying them again and again, because, uh, Father, we're slow to learn sometimes. Uh, we're distracted easily, Lord. Our memories fell. Uh, we're fallen. Uh, so, Lord, thank you for being patient with us and uh, uh, for saying things again and again in our lives and in your word, especially the important things, Father. May we, may we remember uh, the importance of Passover, the importance of these chapters you're showing us tonight. Open your word to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, Passover was a feast to remember. It was a freedom festival, you might say. Um, an annual reminder of how God brought his people out of the land of Egypt and, and out of the house of bondage. Um, I'm not going to re- repeat all of that. I like what Charles per- Spurgeon said, and I'm going to explain a little bit about it, but he says this, it is our firm conviction and increasing belief that the historical books of Scripture were intended to teach us by types and figures spiritual things. We look upon the book of Exodus as being a book of types of the deliverances which God God will give to his people, not only as a history of what he has done in bringing them out of Egypt, uh, leading them through the Red Sea, guiding them through the wilderness, but also as a picture of his faithful dealings with all his people, whom by the blood of Christ he separates from the world, and by his strong and mighty hand takes us out of our house of bondage to, of course, the promised land." Um, the, the, this, that was not Scripture. Uh, that was Charles Spurgeon. The one word that, that I sometimes take issue with, they will say, well, Passover is a type. It's a type of salvation that, that teaches us about the New Testament t- salvation. I don't like the word type. 
A lot of theologians have used it, and if you read commentaries and a lot of your Bibles, even your notes, it will say, well, Moses was a type of Christ. He was a type of deliverer. Well, when I say, like, this is a type of paper and this is a type of paper, both of these are paper. So when I say this is a type of Jesus, a type of Christ, and it makes, it bothers me some because there's only one, right? Good. Y'all are tracking with me. The language that I like to use there, and here I am, uh, you know, little pastor in the middle of Corsicana, Texas, uh, you know, small town in Texas to, compared to most towns with not, you know, uh, a 17 titles behind my name, and here I'm about to correct Charles Spurgeon, right? That doesn't sound very humble. But you'll hear me use the word picture. This is a picture of our salvation. This is a picture so I like that word better because if we all go on a vacation and uh, you go, you know, to see the Grand Canyon and you take all sorts of pictures and you bring back and you say, oh, look, uh, this, is a, this is the Grand Canyon. Is it really the Grand Canyon? Can I smell the wind and feel the air? Can I climb the rocks? It's just a picture, right? Y'all are with me. Um, it's just a picture. It's not the real thing. It's a picture of the real thing. And so when I say Moses is a picture of Christ, of a deliverer, I can see that. He is not the deliverer, right? But he's a picture. And so he's going to deliver the Israelites not out of their bondage to sin, but out of bondage. He's going to take them through the wilderness, right, uh, where they're going to grow and learn. And, and then he's going to deliver them to the promised land. So I could say, you know what? The, the slavery in Egypt is a picture of sin, that works. It's not sin. It's just a picture of it. And, and Moses is a picture of what Christ did delivering them out, right? But this is why he can't be a type. Did Moses die to set the people free? See, he can't be, he can't be a type, but he can be a picture. And so we are given all throughout the, the Old Testament pictures, pictures of what Jesus is going to do later in the New Testament. Um, baptism is one of those pictures, and it's important we understand that. Baptism is not salvation. That's what I tell kids all the time. It's not salvation. It's not what saves us. It's a picture of your salvation, right? It's, it's you telling other people, this is what's already happened inside my heart and my life. It's, it's a picture of that. Communion is not our salvation. It's not. That, that blood is, is grape juice, and that little cracker is not really the body of Christ. Some people will say that you take that and it turns into flesh and blood in your belly because that's how we are saved. No, no, no. It's a, a picture of Christ, right? It's not a type. That's weird. Um, that's why I, I, I would be careful there. So what we're going to look at tonight is how communion is a great, or how Passover, not, commun not just communion, but how Passover was such a great picture of our salvation, and how communion and Passover in the church are very, very similar. And so, uh, beyond all this, there's, there's a lot, uh, lot of spiritual meaning in Passover, and Moses is going to repeat the instructions actually four times here um, over chapter 12 and 13. So, a lot of this is repetition, but I want to highlight some things about the Passover meal that maybe we missed. First point that I want to make is Passover was a meal that was to be shared. It was a meal that was to be shared. It was a meal to eat, and it was a meal to explain. We're going to talk first about the meal to share. Look at chapter 12, verse 47. It says this, it was a meal to share. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. Now, this is something God had said from the very beginning on the instruction of the Passover. Um, if you go back to verse 6 in chapter 12, I've got to turn my Bible back a page, uh, it says this, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So this is partly a matter of public safety. The destroyer was coming, all the firstborn sons, if they were going to be safe, the door had to be uh, covered with the blood of the lamb. So God said no one is to go outside of their house until morning, um, and that was Exodus 1222, but all the Israelites need to celebrate it at the same time and all together. But even after death passed over, um, and then we'll talk later about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but God told them to hold a sacred assembly. 
which meant the whole community came together and worshiped. Um, and we, we know that in chapter 12, verse 16. And if anyone refused to participate, it says in verse 15 of chapter 12, that person was cut off from Israel. Um, they, were, they were told to leave. So God told his people during Passover, all you need to stay up to watch. Uh, the Lord is going to hold vigil and protect you. And all of you are going to share this meal in your homes together. Um, you know, in America, we have this idea going on that uh, we, we experience and celebrate um, our relationship with Jesus personally. Now, don't be confused here. You are the only one that can come to Jesus for you. Hear that? Your faith has to be personal. But God did not create faith to be a matter of, of just you or your home or your, your, you know, your household even. Um, it's interesting. A lot of times I'll have students that will get saved and make decisions or children, and I'll have the parents will say, oh, no, no, we don't, we don't want to do baptism at the church. We'll just, we'll just baptize them in the bathtub. Or we'll just baptize them down at the creek. Happens all the time. And the mom or dad or whoever will go down and they'll have a baptism cer ceremony. Apart from the church, apart from the body of Christ, apart from any fellowship. Um, and it's real interesting to me because they'll, they'll say this. Our faith to us is really personal. It's really personal. We don't see that really in the Old Testament or the New Testament. We don't see, in fact, the word fellowship, uh, the fellowship of Christ. It's that we share Christ together. And so there's something about this meal. All the Israelites came together and, and uh, they worshiped. They went to their homes uh, and their families. They ate the meal together. But the salvation was not to be in individual terms. And, and so often we talk about a personal relation with Jesus. But our Christianity is about what God has done for me. But uh, in, the, in the New Testament, you read about the communion of the saints the fellowship of the saints. In salvation, God has joined us together. Even when I do baptism, what do I say? I say, you're buried, uh, uh, or I say, I baptize you, my brother in Christ, or my sister in Christ, because we're created to be a family. That's why a fellowship meal is so good. I love, we're going to talk about eating in a minute. I love to talk about eating, but uh, I'm going to prove to you it's biblical also. Get ready. You're going to be surprised how many times God talks about eating in Scripture, but uh, Christianity is not just about what God has done for me. Um, when the New Testament explains salvation, and, and you can look at this, it's almost always given in the plural. Um, I'll give you one example. Titus chapter 3, verse 4. I believe it out on the screen. It says this, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs. Notice all the plural pronouns. I challenge you when you're reading the New Testament, uh, anytime salvation's mentioned, look for those plural pl pronouns. They almost always exist. Because our relationship with Jesus is to be shared with one another. Since God wants to gather a people for his glory, corporate worship is an essential part of his saving plan. Um, that's why it's absolutely vital for Christians to be faithful in attending public worship. And I know I sound like a preacher there. When I talk to people all the time, I'll say, I would love, I know I sound like a preacher, but I'm going to invite you to church. And it's not been, you know what their first response is? Yeah, you want me to tithe, don't you? right? It's, there's just this idea out there, or you just want to be full, have your building full so that you're a successful pastor. Um, I, I really, I could care less about those things. Those things happen, you know, automatically. God takes care of that. What I care about is that you're connected to a fellowship of believers, and I believe that the biblical model for Christian growth is corporate worship. It's coming together as the body of Christ. I believe that's biblical, not just, it doesn't just work. So, you know, I, I have a hard time. It's one of the bad things about COVID that m most of us saw. You know, we were a uh, little bitty church in Dillion, Texas through the heart of COVID. And of course, I'm like every other pastor. We're figuring out how to do online services and Facebook and YouTube. And I hated that stuff. I hated that stuff. And, uh, you know, the first time you're doing a Facebook sermon and you see like three people watching it, 
you realize like 90% of the congregation doesn't even know how to get on Facebook. And a lot of you older people probably didn't. And, and, or YouTube, and you've learned Facebook and YouTube, and your kids came over and showed you how, right? Uh, some of you still don't know how. Uh, that was great. It was great. But every pastor that took a pulpit at that time and looked at a camera, we had a communion table just like this, and we'd set a tripod right here, right in my face behind the pulpit, and no one would be out here, and I'd be preaching to that camera, and I would say, you know what, we don't have to come together to be the church. And I, brought, I probably said it 50 times through, those, through those, that year. Just trying to convince, you know what, it's gonna be okay, Stan, you're right. And the more time that went by, it was funny, people knew that Sunday morning, because I didn't feel right doing it Saturday night, I just didn't feel right coming down and preaching Saturday night and then playing it on Sunday morning, you know. And plus, it was weird because if I played it Sunday morning, I had to sit in my recliner and watch myself. And that, man, uh, nothing weirder than hearing you're like, man, that guy's an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I would come down Sunday morning. Well, for a while, people were excited. Like, I can watch you from my recliner in my underwear. This is great. I love this. And it, everything was going good. And then after a while, people found out, you know what, Daniel's down there at the church at 9 30, 10 o'clock, we'd hear, preaching to a camera. And we'd hear knocks on the door. Like, and then, like four or five people are like, I'm coming to church. I want to see people, right? And they're wearing masks and distancing and all that stuff. But man, and then all of a sudden, other people realize he's not just talking to a camera anymore. I think somebody else is in the sanctuary with him. And, and the next week, there was a few more, and there's a few more. And so everybody, all the pastors are asking, well, are you opening your doors? Are you opening your doors? I don't have a choice. They're going to kick them down. Uh, we didn't just like ever announce, hey, we're, we're having church. We just never really locked the doors. And people started coming, and eventually the room was full again, and you know everything has kind of gone down. Uh, we encouraged safety and all that, and we had rooms that, that you, know, you could hide in if you needed to. But uh, it was cool because... What we learned is I didn't have to guilt people into coming to church, right? It, it's kind of interesting because a lot of times now you meet people and you're like, well, you don't go to church. And you, I feel bad because I'm like, I know I'm going to have to talk. You really need to come to church, right? You need to be there. But what we found out through COVID was people started really missing it, that fellowship and that communion. And, and so I stopped saying like, we can be the church and never come together, I realize that that doesn't pan, theologically, it doesn't even make sense in New Testament because the church was a gathered body of local believers. You look in the Bible, it's always like the church at Corinth or the church at Ephesus or the church at, you know, Laodicea. Uh, all these churches, in fact, most of the letters are Paul's writing in geographic areas. Maybe, maybe there's one reference in the entire New Testament to a global, we always have this idea, well, we're a church, but then there's the big idea church, like the global church. You know, in Scripture, maybe one reference, maybe when Peter, when Jesus asked uh, uh, Peter, who you say I am, and, and he says, and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell. That's the only reference in the New Testament to this global big idea church. Every other reference in the New Testament to a church is the church at. That's why North side, Corsicana matters. You're the church at, now I don't care where you live, but you're choosing to meet together here on Beaton Street, right? We meet on Beaton Street. And so, um, that, that rhymes, by the way. <laughs> Didn't even mean to do that, Gary. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, but th this fellowship, and so I, I'm not driving. I, I, I do want to drive it home a little bit, but uh, Hebrews 10, 25 says that. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Um, I do think it's so important that uh, we come together. And Passover was a meal to share. It was something that the whole community came together, even though you ate it in your homes. You had to, you come together, they celebrate, and, and they had this big uh, worship service, basically. Then they all went to their homes and shut their doors because the angel of death was coming, right? Uh, they had to, and they, they shut the doors. Later on, they don't do that. Uh, they actually celebrate the whole meal together. But sharing the Lord's Supper is a very powerful symbol in the church of unity and community in Christ. The word for Lord's Supper, 
uh, that is used all throughout the New Testament is the, the word koinonia. And it literally is the fellowship, the fellowship, the table of fellowship, um, or uh, the, you know, the fellowshipping of the body of Christ. That's why uh, people ask me all the time, can I, can I take the Lord's Supper at home with my family? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that, but not only that, right? Uh, in fact, there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to be a pastor or a deacon, by the way, to lead the Lord's Supper. Uh, I encourage fathers. I uh, mean, it's a great thing to sit around the table with your kids and say, hey, I think we need to recenter our, our lives on really what matters. I don't have any problem with that at all, but the, the word koinonia, the, the word for the Lord's table that is used over and over again, uh, it is in the body of Christ, the coming together of the body of Christ. Don't forsake that. Don't forsake that. Um, and, and you're not going to get that anywhere. So when people ask, can I just take communion at home? Yeah, and at church, but not just at home. You can add, yeah, an and to that. Can I take communion up to the nursing home? and go door to door. Uh, man, I love doing that. You know, that's one of the most neglected groups of people. I know Bobby, some of them help with that some. Uh, there's The first time I started doing that years ago in ministry, um, I, we just took grape juice and little little styrofoam crackers that dissolved that nobody could choke on. And you'd go into a room and uh, to a Christian believer and say, um, I'd pray with him and say, would you like to take communion today? You know what they haven't done in 10 years sometimes? It's a cool moment to sit there with a fellow person, you know, in the body of Christ and take communion. And we, so we, we got to, uh, we used to do entertainment things. You go in nursing homes and do worship services and play games and all that. Well, we got where all we would do would bring in and, and, and in an activity room, we'd have 30 or 40 people circle up and, and take communion together. And I'd bring a few deacons and some Welch's grape juice, and we would put the crackers in the grape juice so that they were soggy before they took them so that nobody choked, Right. I have never seen, you know, that room more than they play this game where you have noodles, these pool noodles, and you hit the balloons in the air. You get older, get ready. You can have some fun. <laughs> You're going to rev revert to your childhood. Uh, more people showed up for communion than the balloon game, right? And it was so cool because I'm going down, and, and, I, and I always, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I always explain what it is, and we share the gospel, and if you're a Christian here today, we want you to take, and I had one little lady that, that, uh, uh, she, the, the, the one church that came did not practice open communion. The one church that would bring communion. And she went to every worship service that they did and heard every sermon. But when they have communion, because she wasn't a member of their specific denomination, they would not let her take. And that Sunday when I went around and I brought that cracker and grape juice and she said, you're going to let me take? And I said, well, are you a believer? And she smiled and said, Yes, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And uh, there's no other requirement. There's no other requirement. She grabbed that on my hand and had swallowed it. I, I was going to pray and kind of lead a service. Um, and and I, I just never, as an act of worship, with tears streaming down her face, um, and, and never missed another service, um, started doing that monthly down there, coming down. There's just something about that coming together of corporate Christians. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in just a church context. Even there, we weren't a church. There, man, there were Methodists and Baptists and Pentecostal. Man, we had some, uh, all sort, we had, had all sorts of different traditions going on, but believers, not other religions, just other denominations. Um, but we could all unite around the table of Christ. Isn't that cool? That's what was so fun about uh, and Raj and I were real intentional about that during Easter, uh, Palm Sunday. We said, we're going to have a joint service. And we said, let's take communion, Spanish and English all together, just to show language divides us, but that's it, because we're one in Christ. And uh, uh, it excites me. That's the picture of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to show you a little bit more. We're going to get a little deeper about, about this. But uh, it was a meal to share. Um, it helped unite God's people into one community. So Paul explains to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and I have this on the screen, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ. That word sharing is the word koinonia, by the way. It's a fellowship. Is it not a fellowship in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a fellowship, a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many, I love that, we who are many are one body, 
for we all partake of the one bread. Isn't that pretty? I love the language there. It doesn't matter the color of our skin, the culture, you know, how many dollars you have in the bank account, where you're from, where you live, what language you spend. There's just one body, one blood, one bread. And, and in communion we come and we take it together um, in some mysterious way by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Christians who eat the bread and drink the cup, man, we're spiritually connected to Christ. That's what that says. We've, we partake in him. Um, I love that. Because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body. I like Passover, the Lord's Supper, is a meal to be shared. Um, now, I'm going to get a little specific here. Passover was also a meal for all God's people to share. Everyone was included. This is going to surprise you. It kind of surprised me as I studied this. Every man, woman, and child in Israel. But there were some exclusions. Um, look at chapter 12, verse 43 and 45, really. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. A temporary resident and a hired worker may not eat of it. Uh, to be blunt, God discriminated. Passover was for his people and his people only, right? Um, the question about who was eligible for Passover came up almost immediately because the Israelites weren't the only ones who left Egypt. Uh, chapter 12, verse 38 says, many other people went up with them. So uh, the King James Version says a mixed multitude went up, meaning, meaning there was a variety of ethnic backgrounds. So some of them may have been Egyptians who feared the God of Israel. Some of them would have been other slaves uh, from other tribes um, who left with Israelites. We don't really know, but the question naturally arose as to, well, can they keep this feast also? And the basic answer was no. Passover was exclusive. It was only for the people of God and not for outsiders. Now, I'm going to change this in a minute. Stay with me. But foreigners and migrant workers were not allowed to keep the feast. The reason is they weren't part of the covenant community um, of God at that time. Um, I'm going to explain why in a minute. They, in, in New Testament terms, we would say they weren't believers. This was not a matter of race. It was a matter of grace. These outsiders had not yet put their faith in the God of Israel, and so they had no right to receive the atonement that he had provided through the Passover lamb. Um, it wasn't appropriate for them to receive the sign of salvation because they hadn't trusted in the blood of the lamb. Now, let's compare that to the Lord's Supper, right? We here uh, at Northside practice what we call open communion. Now, what we mean by open communion is communion is open to anyone and everyone that believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? Some churches mean open communion by anybody and everybody that comes to the door. Now, uh, I do my best when we take communion to say, if you're a believer here today, we want you to shake, take with us. If you believe in Jesus Christ, we want you to take with us. Some churches would even say, and some of you may, may disagree with me here, and I, that's okay, that you have to be baptized to take the Lord's Supper. Some churches will say that. I am not one of those church uh, believers that, that requires baptism to take the Lord's Supper. Um, I had a young man one time come forward and put his faith in Jesus Christ right here at the front. Man, gloriously saved. Y'all have seen that before on a Sunday. You know, Sunday we had a, a lady come down, and I'm not kidding you. The power, man, the Holy Spirit was on. She was ready to believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, I stay out of the God's way, right? So that happened this one Sunday, this young man, he was jumping up and down. I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, and I'm gonna become a Christian. And man, we prayed, he prayed, put his faith in Jesus Christ. We sat down because it's time to take communion. And we're taking communion. And, and this deacon leans over to me and says, and I love him, and, and God bless him. He wasn't trying to be evil, but he says, he hadn't been baptized yet. And man, I sat there and thought that, that he's so excited, he's ready to take communion. For the first time ever, he understands what the blood and the body of Christ is, and I'm about to have to tell this young man, you got to be dunked in water first. And I started to lean over, and man, what hit my spirit. And, and I'm not saying God, you know, opened up a portal of heaven or heard anything verbal, but I thought, how more saved can this young man get? That was the question I had. Any more saved? Is there any more saved than saved? Right? And so I, I, I did what I felt need to be done. And I gave that young man communion, tears streaming down his face. Man, he, uh, we went through that ordinance together and I sat by his mom and his dad and him there in that front pew and, and man, everybody was excited. And, and afterwards, man, I got a good lecture from a deacon and, 
And it was okay. By the end of it, he knew I loved Jesus. I knew he loved Jesus, and, and uh, we disagreed about that. But the more I've thought about it, the more adamant I've gotten that, you know, you can't get any more saved than saved. Now, do I agree in water baptism? Do I think you ought to follow in believer's baptism? Absolutely. It doesn't negate that. It doesn't say I don't think it's important. Um, but what I'm saying is when people come to Jesus, man, he, he's saved by the same body and blood uh, sacrifice that I was. And so this, this picture here is something that, that as a pastor you're taught in seminary, we call it fencing the table. It means you ought to make it a little difficult for somebody that's not a believer to partake in a very serious ordinance without really understanding what they're doing. Because there are some very serious verses in the New Testament about some have taken and gotten sick, and some have even died, right? So, uh, the old Scottish Presbyterians called it fencing the table. A pastor had to get up and give a warning, not to keep people from Christ, but to make it clear that if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ in faith, you don't need to partake today. Um, now, this is the cool thing that happens when you do that correctly. Some people kind of get upset. They don't like that I say that on Sunday mornings, uh, that we have communion. Uh, and not, not, again, we don't have anybody fighting with me about it. They just say, I, I just, just invite everybody. Well, I don't, I don't think that's biblical. I think it's dangerous, first off, because we're warned not to do that. If you're not a believer, don't take. But what I say is, hey, we're going to have communion today. If you're a Christian here today, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, we want you to take with us. If you're not, just let it pass you by, and you watch and listen and hear and if you want to be saved today, you can be, and you can become part of this fellowship. The reason that I'm so adamant about that, because I remember, and my parents, when we were very young, very young, I think maybe mom and dad just didn't want to fight the fight. Um, we were raised, uh, you know, in church, and they would pass communion. We were little bitty. I remember taking grape juice and crackers. I remember thinking, oh, this is fun. This is like snack time at church, right? There came a time when we got a little bit older, and I remember it very distinctly. We were old enough to understand, seven or eight years old, and mom leaned over to my brother and I when communion was coming, and she said, this is for people that believe in Jesus, that are Christians, that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. You guys can't take. And I remember after church, I was really upset about it. We went to Pizza Hut in Shawnee, Oklahoma. I'll never forget, I could take you to the booth that we sat in, and... and it bothered me so much, and I said, I, we, we had a good talk about it. I was ready, and mom and dad, again, shared the gospel with us and talked a lot about it, and the very next week, when I went to Sunday school, um, I told my Sunday school teacher I wanted to become a Christian because I believed in Jesus Christ, and I believe he died on the cross of my sins, and I wanted to take communion, right? Um, I'm not saying I'm a believer today because of this. Uh, what I'm saying is it's a great tool to present the gospel to an unbeliever, right? There's something about that moment where you're letting that pass you by, that you're recognizing, I have not put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's a tangible scene. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, when you see somebody do that, that you turn and shake your head at them, right? Uh, what I ask you as a church to do when you see somebody pass communion, what's a great idea we could do? You can visit with them about it. You can pray for them silently right there, that the Holy Spirit move in their heart. You know, um, I love that moment. And so, uh, again, I'm, I'm teaching you the connections. Passover wasn't available to everyone. The Lord's Supper isn't even. We, we draw that fence around the, around the table. Um, there is a way to be saved, however, and that's to come to God in faith. And the way the people did that in the time of Moses, get ready, because I told you if you weren't part of the covenant community, you couldn't. Um, it's a lot easier today than it was then. In the time of Moses, you had to receive the sign of circumcision to join the covenant community. We're going to see that. Look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 44. Any slave you have bought may eat of it after you have circumcised him. Um, the practice of circumcising slaves went all the way back to God's covenant with Abraham. I'm not going to teach all that tonight. Um, but he said to Abraham, this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you're to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You're to undergo circumcision. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. 
for the generations to come, every male among you is eight days old, must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner. Those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. So since the time of Abraham, God had allowed slaves to become members of the covenant community, even though they weren't Jewish, um, once they were circumcised, they were able to and eligible to share Passover. Uh, slaves were not the only non-Israelites that were allowed to share Passover. Um, the privilege was also extended to aliens or foreigners. Leviticus 19 talks about that. Um, any, any alien or foreigner was allowed once they were circumcised. So, um, however, they were not allowed to celebrate Passover unless they were. So, God told to Moses, this is Exodus 12, verse 48, look at it, it says this, an alien living among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised, then he may take part like one born in the land. So, you didn't have to be born in the land, you didn't have to be Israelite, uh, you just had to be circumcised. No uncircumcised male may eat of it. The same law applies to the native born and the alien living among you. So, circumcision was the prerequisite for Passover. So the regulations show that God has always offered salvation to everyone. And I know that's a deep text to kind of bring tonight. It's, it's where we are, and I didn't want to skip over it, but man, I like that because so many people say, well, uh, you know, God in the Old Testament was so centered just on the Jewish people. No, you could be a Gentile. You could be an alien. You could be a foreigner and, and take Passover with the Jewish people if you obey the covenant of circumcision. Now, you say, well, that's not fair. That's making them do something extra. No, it's not. All the Jews had to do it too. See what I'm saying? It wasn't extra. It wasn't adding to, Gary. Yeah, not very good. Yeah, yeah. Think a, think a dull rock, buddy. Uh, yeah, um, and you know, it, it, it's interesting because you know, when we get to the New Testament, of course, we know that uh, circumcision was just a picture of, of what Christ does in our hearts uh, in cutting us off from the world. Um, it's just, a, again, a picture. Remember that, that I started with? It's not the real thing. It's just a picture. But the, the Israelites understood to be one of God's people. This is the covenant that God made with us, and this is what the men of the house had to do in order to say, we believe in God. We're putting our faith in Him. We're part of God's covenant community. But but, but if you weren't and you wanted to be, right, you just had to have a medical procedure. That uh, It's weird. We don't have to understand it, right? don't have to understand it. Uh, and, and again, I'm not going to go into details, but it was well understood during that time. Now look at Matthew 8, 11. I have it on the screen. Uh, interesting verse. Many will come from east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I love this verse because this is a picture of Passover, the feast of Passover. Um, in heaven, we're setting down, and not just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but from the east and the west, all over the world, the gospel would go out to all the nations. Jesus was saying, even outsiders are going to come and share in God's feast. So uh, I love the picture here. Um, even in the Old Testament, sometimes, again, people say the Old Testament is just about the Jews, just, but, but no, the door was always open. It was always open um, to these foreigners in the covenant community, but they had to do it God's way. So there's one requirement today, one requirement, uh, of course, for communion, for taking communion, and that is we have a personal faith in Jesus Christ. doesn't matter what nation you're from. doesn't matter what people group. It's absolutely essential. doesn't matter the money you're bank, where you live, where you're raised. doesn't matter how much sin you have uh, in your life. The one requirement is faith in Jesus Christ. I've taught this and, and over and over again. Sometimes pastors will get up and say, before you take today, uh, once you take time and examine your lives. You've heard that, right? Scripture says to examine ourselves, examine ourselves. And so what people sometimes do, and I'm, I'll pre preach a sermon on this one these days, is they think, okay, have I been good enough this week to take communion? And so I've had people before, I had, I had some very prominent friends before, uh, deacons actually, as I'm passing, not here, but in previous fellowship that I'm passing, I'm taking the communion to the deacons. It's a neat picture. Um, I'm going to make uh, my camera guy mad if I move too much. I'm taking communion to all the deacons, and 
and one of them he, he doesn't take. And so privately later I said, hey, I wanted to check on you. Is everything okay spiritually? I noticed you didn't take communion today. Um, what's going on, brother? How can I pray for you? I can talk. He said, well, I just, I've been struggling with some things in my family, and he had some family things going on. It wasn't even with him personally. He said, I just don't feel like, uh, you know, I've, I've lived in such a way. Man, if taking communion is about us being perfect or even good, you've missed the entire point, right? Because we're approaching the table of Christ that died to take away our sin, right? Um, and for us to approach that with this idea that I have to earn it before I take it, it it's the exact opposite of the entire meaning of communion. And so, I, you know, when, when we talk about the requirements of communion, uh, to take communion, it, it's very simple. In the Old Testament, the requirement to be part of the covenant community of God was circumcision. We can say that's weird and not like it, but the requirement to be in the family of God today, the body of Christ, is faith in Jesus Christ. Were the women allowed to participate if the men, If the men were circumcised, the family was allowed. Okay, um, yes. Now, prominent leadership roles, not, not so much, but the women shared the table of Passover, yes. Yes, but the men had to be circumcised, which, again, is, is a great picture of, of, you know, problem that we have today. Uh, God always linked to male leadership in those homes, and we're failing at that in America today. I'm not picking on us here at church, but, uh, and I'm not underemphasizing the roles of women. You ladies, uh, man, in, uh, filled with the same spirit of God, same spiritual gifts, man, uh, not same ministries. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, lowering that standard, but that doesn't also mean that men don't play a role, a prominent role in the body of Christ. So, yeah, uh, it was up to the men. Uh, even in the New Testament times, interestingly enough, if the man came to Christ, the whole family would be baptized um, most of the time. Now, that wasn't because it was automatic. It was because the men held such leadership in the home, right? When they shared their faith with their wife and kids, most of the time, the entire family. You can go to places like Bangladesh today where if you can get the tribal leader to accept Christ, the whole village, they're not forced to, the whole village will accept Christ. It doesn't mean their conversion's less real, right? It just means they're, they're going to trust and follow that leader. That's how important a man is in a home. But this is a good question. Heading to something else. Yeah, now I would, I would say what, what Stan's bringing up there, um, you know, if, if you had an offense, and there is talking about don't come and give this amazing offering before God and worship God if you have an offense with your brother at home. Um, you know, what, what's, what's being discussed there is if you've got something internally wrong, don't be showy on the outside and, and not real in your relationship with people. I would, I would argue pretty adamantly that when we approach the Lord's table, right, um, if, we, if we look backwards at our life for, I've got to have every relationship perfect, right? None of us will ever be able to take communion. But I will say, stand there. Yeah, if you're, if you're in open defiance and rebellion against God, right? <laughs> I'd be careful. I'd be careful. Um, because what's happening there is you don't mean this anyway. You don't mean this anyway, right? Um, and, and if every time you take communion, you're thinking, man, I've got to do this because I'm going to send some more tomorrow. Um, you know, again, I'm not saying I, I, I would be careful. Um, I think that that's part of that examining our hearts to see, do you mean this? Are you genuine? Not are you perfect, right? Uh, where's your faith at? That's right. Do this in remembrance of me. Oh, to sinners. And so the danger of any, any ordinance uh, is, and that's why Passover was once a year. 
communion. You know how often we're supposed to do communion? Anybody know? As often as you want to, right? As often as you meet together. Anybody, do you have so many? Anytime you want to. I like that. So people come up here and I get questions all the time. Well, why don't we do it weekly? I don't know. Good, I guess. Why don't we do it monthly? Why don't we do it, you know, we do it quarterly here, by the way, in case you wonder. But guess what? When we did it Palm Sunday, that wasn't quarterly. Did y'all check the bylaws on me? Um, Because the bylaws, our bylaws, don't say to do it quarterly. They say to do it at least quarterly. Because all our, our leaders wanted to make sure happened there was that we didn't forget and that a pastor for sure did it at least. I could do it weekly. We could do it four Sundays in a row. We could do it Wednesday and Sunday every, if we wanted to, uh, as long as we do it quarterly. Question mark? So Mark's asking about, and we'll jump, I don't mind jumping to that for a second, you know, to join Northside Baptist Church, you have to be baptized. So uh, to, to fellowship here in, the, in Northside Baptist Church, now I'm going to be careful because Scripture, Scripture does not lay down this requirement to be part of a body of Christ, a local body of Christ. Our bylaws lay down that requirement, Mark, for baptism. It does not have to be in this baptistry. Um, It has to be in a baptistry of like faith and order, and it has to be biblically baptized, which we say is by immersion. So we say, yeah, you have to be dunked, and you have to be in a church of like faith and order. Uh, Now, I'll give you my, my encouragement there. I do believe in the New Testament to be part of the... So how do I know... Somebody's a believer, right? New believer. Um, they come in the church. The public profession of that faith many times happens at baptism, at baptism. And so in order to, I, I tell people I don't like secret believers. So people come in and say, I want to join the church, but I don't want anybody to know it. You see how that's counterintuitive. That the church is about fellowship, right? We're, we're working against. So, so uh, typically, I do a lot of counsel there and wait, um, So, because I do believe baptisms are real important. Um, I do have people that, uh, this is what I say to people that come in, say, I'm saved, but I don't want to be baptized. Well, we still have a pew for you, right? You can come and worship every week with us, uh, but you, you can't join the church until you follow in believer's baptism. Um, and that's per Northside's bylaws, not, uh, not necessarily scripture. I agree with that, by the way. Again, I agree with it. I don't have a, a problem with it. Uh, the same way, you know, uh, baptism is not mentioned before taking communion, right? Uh, now, I don't think somebody that's not baptized gets to heaven and God says, well, you're not part of my church, right? Because can you get any more saved than saved? We come back to that. So, but to be identified in a local body of believers, it's a public thing. It's a public thing. It's a fellowship, uh, right? So I think we need that public part. Have a comment there? Heard somebody? Okay. It's a good question, Mark. And, and I get that a lot. Um, you know, back uh, early on in the 60s in Baptist churches, I bet you guys practiced this at some point, uh, landmarkism was a big deal. And for those of you like, what's landmarkism? It meant that in order to take communion in a church, in order to be a member of a church, you had to be baptized in that tub right there. So people would come in and say, I'm coming from First Baptist Church in Waxahachie. I moved to Corsicana. I've been a member there for 65 years. I was baptized when I was 12 years old. Fill the tub up, and then you can join here. Um, Again, that is not a right of membership. It's not a a hazing act, right? Uh, So I don't don't like that. It's not our contract between somebody. Um, People say, well, if you don't baptize them, how do you know what what they believe? Well, guess what? I can baptize a Muslim up there. It doesn't change what they believe. The way you find out what somebody believes, you ask questions. And that's my job as pastor and, and uh, our staff. Man, we, we find somebody, when somebody wants to join, where are you from? What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about the Word of God? We find out those questions, and then we present them to you guys for membership, right? Um, there is a, a system there. But um, Lord's Supper is, is uh, you know, like church membership, like communion, or like baptism. Um, there ought to be some rules behind it. We better keep moving. Um, 12 verse 9, uh, and this I'm going to be fast on. Um, 
Passover was to be a meal that was eaten. It was to be a meal, a meal that was eaten. Um, I think it matters um, when I looked at Scripture how many times God put the gospel in terms of something we could eat. <laughs> Just think about it. And, and I'm going to show you a bunch of times that this happened. Like Genesis 14, Melchizedek brings out bread and wine to Abraham. Um, many biblical worship services ended with a meal. Began the Moses, Moses and the elders of Israel on Mount Sinai, Exodus 24, sat down to a meal. When Ezra and Nehemiah renewed the covenant, they sat down to a meal in, in Nehemiah 8:10. Moses' Old Testament sacrifices were all to be eaten, enjoyed choice fruit, fruits and our food and sweet drinks. Um, it's interesting to me, even in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 9, the first thing we get to heaven, you know what we're going to do the first thing when we get to heaven? We're going to sit down at a supper, the marriage supper. Um, so that's why I don't ever have a problem with our fellowship meal. It's biblical. Uh, it's biblical to eat together. And, um, you know, often Scripture, we see that. Uh, I think the reason that God gives us something to eat and drink at communion or at Passover also, it helps us understand the gospel by making salvation something we can see and touch and even taste. Uh, it also was a form of fellowship. It, it helped us and caused us to get together. Um, you know, even Jesus in Revelation uh, 3.20 says, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Uh, Jesus has this picture. Read the New Testament sometime and see how many times Jesus came into a home and ate with people, right? Uh, we're going to be looking at some of those texts in the next few weeks on Sunday mornings, but uh, from Zacchaeus all the way, I mean, everywhere he goes, he's sitting down and eating with people. But um, the, the lamb was eaten, and it had to be eaten totally. Um, there's something that I want to bring up about that uh, just in passing. Why would they have the lamb, Passover lamb, eaten totally or burnt to a crisp? You either ate it or you burn it totally up, whatever's left. It had everything to do. How many of you like leftovers? Raise your hand if you like leftovers. Okay. I do not. My wife knows this, and, and I, I, I will save and I will eat leftovers, but I don't like to. My mother and father in law were here yesterday, and she took every Tupperware from my fridge that I had with leftovers in it. Because my wife said, Daniel won't eat them. He won't eat them. She took them. They will. Um, something about a few days. I'm like, no, I'm not risking that. Um, <laughs> so what would be wrong or different? Can you imagine? You have this sacrificial Passover lamb, and you're going to put it in Tupperware, and you're going to invite your neighbors over to eat it the next day? See the problem there? Because those neighbors may not have been part of the covenant community of Christ. See, the danger of saving Passover. So that's why if I'm walking down the hallway and I'm ready for a snack here at the church, I mean, it's kind of weird to go into the communion table, open up a box of those crackers. <laughs> right? Everybody would say that's, that's probably not right. It's dangerous, right? Now, we would all agree that's just, it's just crackers, it's not special until it's in that moment, but we all agree, no, that's probably not a good idea. Kind of, kind of drawing a line there, and I haven't done that, by the way. <laughs> I mean, we put cheese and ham on them. No, uh, whoever would eat the ham, did I say ham at Passover, right? Um, this would be, that helps us understand what would be wrong with putting the Passover lamb, right, and saving it for the next day. There was this holiness to it. There was this pure, yeah. They, they, they honored it. They had this reverence for it. And it was a complete meal. And salvation was, and Stan mentioned that, it was, a complete, it was complete. It was finished. It was, it was full. Um, and so it, it does matter. Um, you know, it's, but it was a meal, and it had to be eaten totally. And so I like the reverence there. But more than anything, and this is how we're going to end, it was a meal to explain um, what salvation meant especially at that time to the Jews, uh, and then we'll end with communion and how, what that means to us. Look at Exodus 13, verses 8 through 10. Um, on that day, I tell your son. Now, we ought to underline that. On that day, tell your son. Tell your son. So the whole point of this was to explain to the children, to those next generations, what happened. On that day, tell your son. I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. 
This observance will be for you like a sign in your hand and a reminder of your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year after year after year after year after year, after year forever. So what happens in 100 years? The generation that came out of Egypt is dead, right? But the son tells his son that tells his son that tells his son generation after generation, I do this because of what the Lord did for me. See the personal aspect of there? Well, Dad, you weren't there. Well, son, we were all there because we wouldn't be free today if it weren't for what Moses and what God did through, uh, through Moses then. So it was a story told again and again. Now, the Jews, this observance, it says, will be like a sign in your hand and reminding your forehead. The observance, the Passover, will be like a sign in your hand and a reminder of your forehead. So the Jews took this literal, and they got these boxes, and they put the story, basically, the deliverance story, in these boxes, and they bind them to their head, and they wore tassels, and they bind them to their hands because they, they don't want to forget. Totally misreading chapter 13, verse 8. This observance will be like a sign on your hand and a reminder in your forehead. What God was saying is, Passover will keep you from forgetting. It will be like having it written on your forehead if you do this every year and all the time. And so the Jews took it literal and said, we've got to get these boxes and bind them to our heads. God was not saying to bind them. He was saying, practice the Passover. This will be the reminder to you. Um, so even today, they have these little boxes. Um, this is what Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 5. Jesus says, you keep making your little phylacteries, the boxes on your heads, bigger and bigger, and your tassels longer and longer and longer. Um, but on the inside, you're absolutely filthy dirty. You don't even understand what my salvation is. Um, this is the exact verse that Jesus quoted. Because what happens is they just kept making those boxes bigger and bigger because whoever had the bigger box on their forehead loved Jesus more, <laughs> right? And the tassels longer and longer. And Jesus said, it doesn't matter how big the box is on your head. What matters is what's in your heart, right? Do you remember? And so I'll uh, kind of get back to that. Let's think about communion. It doesn't matter whether you're in the pew on Sunday and you eat a cracker and take grape juice. What matters is, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? What's going on in your heart? It's a remembrance, right? If you're sitting there thinking about what you're going to eat at bottle cap afterwards, you've missed. Now, I'm not saying you're going to die afterwards, right? What I'm saying is you're missing the whole point, which was remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what communion is. It's, it's that box on our forehead, that, that cord wrapped around our hand that keeps us uh, from forgetting. And that's why sometimes uh, as a pastor throughout the years, I've just seen, you know what? I think we're drifting. We need to take communion. And it just, I felt that, that Palm Sunday, man, it just, it recenters you. It reminds you. Uh, years ago, we were kind of in the middle of a church tuffle. And uh, I kind of inherited as, as pastor uh, came in. And actually the fight was previously, it was over baptism. It was about to do Members need to be baptized that come from other churches, or people need to be baptized that come from a Baptist church across town or a Baptist church across the way. And, and there was a big fight going on. And after that big fight, man, that first Sunday, we had just taken it before. We, I said, we're going to take communion because I'm going to remind everybody here, or God's going to remind, that, that, man, don't lose sight of what's most important, right, for these minor theological, uh, and I see that in churches today. It's a great place to come back together as a church to remember why we exist, what we're about, what God has done for us, what Jesus has done for us. Um, and it's a great teaching uh, thing. That's why I tell parents all the time communion. I have these little books that help teach. Uh, man, every time you take communion, I love to see it. If you see it from my view, you see it. Little kids all throughout our sanctuary, and we're going to pass our communion. And I see moms and dads sitting in pews, leaning over and whispering in their kids' ears, their grandkids' ears, and they're saying, this is representative of the body that, of Jesus that died on the cross for us. And this is a picture of the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. And, and uh, man, I love to see that all around the room. I see in the balcony, I see it all over. These, these parents leaning over and, and explaining to their kids, this is why we're given the meal. 
so that we don't forget. Uh, Passover was every bit a picture, uh, and the Lord's Supper we can understand. Um, by testifying to the meaning of Passover, God's people made sure they never forgot salvation. Um, Joshua 5.10, Joshua celebrated it when they got to the promised land. Second Chronicles 30, Second Chronicles 30 verse 5, Hezekiah and Josiah both celebrated Passover when Nehemiah and Ezra dedicated the temple and the wall in Jerusalem. In Ezra 6, chapter 19, they celebrated Passover. Jesus celebrated Passover over and over again with his disciples every year. Um, I want to end with this quote. Um, it's often been observed in any family, in any church, or any nation, the gospel is only one generation from extinction. Just one generation from extinction. Um, it all depends on us passing on this information to the next generation. That's why we have youth programs, by the way, and children's programs. That's why we have invitations every Sunday. Um, but nothing replaces, nothing replaces the, the responsibility of, of the family, of the family. And Passover was one of those meals that you sat down with your kids and you explain what God had done for them. Don't miss the opportunity, grandparents, parents, with communion, to explain to your children what this meal really is about on Sunday mornings. I tell parents, usually a week ahead of time, man, uh, tell your kids, hey, we're going to have communion next week. This is what it means. Explain to them every part of it. Um, it all depends. And that's what God knew. God knew we were forgetful people. He knew we were forgetful people. I often, I'm a handwriter. Anybody else a handwriter in here? I see some. I, I used, man, especially, I used to write all, I mean, I'd have notes all over my hand um, throughout the day, and, and men, you'd sweat, and you're like, I think I knew what that say. Um, God gave us, we don't have to tie a cord on our hand or wear a box on our head. He gave us a way to, to recenter us, to refocus us, to help us remember. Uh, he gave the New Testament church communion, his table to do that. Um, and, and we have a great picture of communion in Passover, we can understand. Go ahead. My granddaughter was over in France, and uh, one Sunday morning she went into a Catholic church. Of course, she's Baptist, and she went in went to go take Passover with her, I mean, communion with him. And as she walked up to the page, a priest put the dip in. She asked her, he said, are you a Catholic? She said, no, he took the bread away from her. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've heard, I've heard you know, close communion, uh, it can be very hurtful. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've heard that oftentimes people come in here and you're, you let us take, and I always say, are you a believer in Christ? Uh, man, none of us are perfect, but uh, you're a believer in Christ. That's what we're saying when we say I'm a believer in Christ. I'm not perfect, but I'm saved. I'm forgiven. And, uh, the, man, the power and the fellowship in that, uh, the same thing, Fred, that you're talking about happens in reverse, when you have somebody come in that is from another place, another language, another skin color, another culture, and yet you can sit down on a mission field and take communion together, um, all, all, what you saw in the bad happens in the good because all of a sudden we realize we have one thing in common that unites us and that propels us forward in the world, and that is Jesus Christ. Um, I love, I love communion because of that. Uh, I always will put emphasis on it. I think there's a lot of, of divisiveness about, and I'll do a whole Bible study after, you know, Mark's question I think is good on baptism and communion. There's so much divisiveness that Satan works in the body of Christ to things that God meant to bring us together. And, uh, you know, one of the greatest things the Corinthians they fought about when they come together at the Lord's table, they actually ate a meal. They actually ate a meal. And Paul said, listen, when you come together and eat a meal, eat before you come so that you don't take all the food off the table. <laughs> you know, and we laugh about that, but that was what the early church was fighting about, right? And then we come out here into our cafeteria and somebody takes all the potatoes. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's so true that so often you can have something meant to bring unity, Right? And, and worship in the body of Christ, and good Baptists will fight over it. And my, my, my goal is not to be uh, controversial, but unified. That's why Christ gave it. We miss the whole point, right? Uh, when we talk about um, 
you know, what kind of crackers were used or what the grape juice is filled with or who passes out what or who prays. Man, we miss the whole significance of it's not about Jesus anymore, right? It's not about Jesus. And so oftentimes at funerals, there are families that are fighting. I'm going to close with this. I'll be done. Uh, families fighting about money or, or wills or you know, you often see, I often see that as a pastor, and I always pull those families together before the funeral, and I'll say, listen, the next hour, two hours, let's just make this about your loved one and remembering them and honoring them. And, and you guys can get your lawyers and do all that if you've got to later, but this next two hours. Um, and so at communion, I've seen fights in churches about things like, I always say, you know what, communion, let's just make it about Jesus and not about the crackers, and not about the grape juice, and not about, let's just make it about Jesus. And it's funny when you say that, everybody goes, we have that in common, we have that in common. That's what it does, and so uh, I'm glad we don't have a fighting church, but I have seen churches that are just at the throes of being pulled apart and sit down on the Lord's table and go, this is what we're really supposed to be about. And I think that's why God gave it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this picture of Passover. Uh, what amazing picture it is. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the, the perfection of that, the real thing that came at the cross of Calvary in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, let us never forget. Uh, Father, and may the Lord's Supper, may communion. Uh, Father, bind it to our head, bind it to our arms. Uh, Father, that we never get very far from the cross of Calvary, Father, that where you saved us, where you set us free from sin. And Father, may we share that story we pass it on generation after generation, uh, Father, to uh, Lord, uh, that uh, everyone would know and, and bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you.